All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back tonight or today. We're going to talk about must pre treatments. So, now that we understand when to harvest grapes, um, under what conditions to harvest them, and just kind of general winemaking styles, now we're going to dive into, we're going to get back into chronological order and we're going to talk about must pre treatments. So, now that we've harvested our grapes, what different kinds of treatments can we utilize? And I also have referenced on here um, what section of our book this is from. This is from Chapter 3, Preparation of Must and Juice from the Principles and Practices of Winemaking Textbook. I also have a really nice article here from uh, Penn State University that's also related. So definitely check it out uh, if you're interested. Okay, so before we get started just reviewing some vocabulary, the first thing is must. And must is just the freshly cru crushed fruit juice containing the skin, seeds, and sometimes the stems of the fruits. So it's the big soupy mixture that we're about to ferment, so it's called must. Then we have um, tannins. Tannins are extracted from seeds and skins of grapes. They're very crucial to the longevity of a wine's shelf life and also give that drying mouth sensation uh, when drinking a lot of red wines. All right, moving on to maceration. That's a process um, used mostly in making red wine that involves exposing or steeping the grape skins in solids um, within the juice um, or fermenting wine. There's a couple different types of macerations. There's a cold maceration, also known as a cold soak. We're going to expand more on this next couple of slides, but this takes place before fermentation, and this is when the juice starts to extract color from the skins. Then we have extended maceration, and this is after fermentation, when alcohol acts as a solvent and it extracts color, tannins, and aroma from the skins, which is aided by heat and also the amount of skin contact and time, of course. So just some review. So a little bit of overview of today. Uh, there's lots of pre-fermentation treatments for our must. We have for part one, we have like cluster and berry sorting. We're going to talk about crushing and destemming um, and also um, direct to press. Part two, we're going to talk about grape freezing, um, cryo concentration, cryo extraction, withering, cold soak, thermo vinification, and saunye, which we talked about saunye in our winemaking section, but it's also a pre fermentation treatment, so we should have it in the section, of course. So we have here some fun pictures. This is a sorting table where we have some victims, I mean volunteers, working to um, separate anything that's a mog material other than grape out of the table and keeping the beautiful grape clusters in. And this will get loaded into the crusher destemmer and pumped into a tank to make awesome wine. Here we have some bins full of fruit that is just in a very, very large room drying out. So we're going to learn what this means in the next couple slides. So first thing you can do once the grapes have been harvested is cluster and berry sorting. So this can be done in the vineyard. Um, it can be done by hand at the sorting tables. And it can also be done by a machine through optical sorting. So this is done to remove mog material other than grapes. Um, and it also increases the quality of the resulting wine. It rem so this is your opportunity to really just like remove a ton of leaves. You see that a lot in the vineyard. They're picking out leaves constantly from the bin. Um, you can also get some like moldy clusters or some mildew sometimes. You just toss those out if they don't look savory. Um, oftentimes the rule of thumb for that is when in doubt, toss it out. If it doesn't look like a cluster you'd want to eat, then don't put it in your wine. That's, that's been a philosophy of a lot of wineries I've worked for. So yeah, moldy clusters are a no. Leaves are also a no because they can give you a lot of uh, bitterness and astringency in your wine too. Same goes for like dirt clods. Sometimes, you know, the pickers are working really hard and they're just exhausted and sometimes weird things fall in their buckets and then they end up into the bin somehow. So just keep an eye out for that. We also get a large array of vineyard critters sometimes. So it's not surprising to find like lizards or spiders in the bins as well. And this is mostly because the pickers are picking the fruit when it's really cold outside. So lizards aren't very mobile when their bodies are cold. So sometimes they'll just be sleeping within a cluster. You know, pickers are picking very quickly. They don't see it. And inevitably the lizard goes in the bucket with the grapes. So 
We always, always fish those out when we see them. Also because we like our lizard friends, they're beneficial to the vineyard. So we want to keep them around. So optical sorting is another way that we can uh, sort through like clusters and berries, of course. So optical sorting will actually take grapes, most of the time berries, through this little conveyor section. You can see that these green stars and little green berries are like leaves and unripe berries. So then we have like an optical reference, a camera here looking as the berries come out of this conveyor. And then these little air jets will actually push out all of the unwanted parts of this little waterfall. And I'll push it into a little reject bin and then you'll have all of the perfectly ripe berries come out in this product outflow section and then it will continue to be processed. So again, this is to make higher quality wine, um, take out any unnecessary bitterness or um, components that you don't want in your wine. Okay, next we have um, crushers and destemmers. They do exactly as they sound, they crush and destem fruit. The purpose of crusher destemmer is really to get better extraction of juice. Um, it crushes, opens the berries, you get more of the juice, you can ferment it. With the berries being opened, you get better maceration of skins. So the opportunity for um, the skins to really settle the juice and extract all those beautiful colors. And then we also have an opportunity to remove stems and um, rachis from the grapes. So those, those are just the little green uh, stems that hold the berries together. Sometimes you do want those, sometimes you don't. Uh, most everywhere I've worked, we've removed them and uh, just fermented the must and it looks a lot like this. So and anytime we remove stems, it always goes back to the earth. We go and spread it back out in the vineyard and it becomes compost. We spread it out over a very large area so that way it's not toxic to anything. Awesome. So during the crushing and destemming process, uh, it's typically crushing first, then destems. This image shows you destemming first and then crushing, which happens as well. But for this process, it does more than just what the last slide said. At this point too, we can also, um, we can control the amount of crushing in grapes. So um, when the grapes come into the hopper, oh man, I don't have a great picture for this. When the grapes come into the hopper, kind of like this, um, and the, you see for this example, when the stems come out, the, um, these like rotors down here that like push up against each other, they kind of have like knuckled like ridges that like press together and have some open spots and then it crushes together. So you can actually adjust the space of how close those pieces are together. So you can control the rate of crushing for your grapes. Um, so you're gonna actually want some whole berries to come through and then most of them to be crushed open berries. So if you have um, whole berries, this actually leads to a slower fermentation with fruitier flavors. This is the carbonic maceration effect that we're talking about down here. So whole berries will actually start fermenting from the inside and they'll kind of just like explode out. And when they do that, they actually produce a lot more fruity flavors and um, it's a slower fermentation. As opposed to crushed berries where you've opened them up and all the juice spills out, that allows for much faster fermentation. A lot of heat's being produced and you get a lot of color extraction from that as well. So of course, it's either one or the other. It's always a combination in winemaking. So a lot of winemakers try to aim for about anywhere between 10 to 30% of the berries that come out of this process to be whole berries in order to get some of that fruity carbonic maceration effects. So and then carbonic maceration for winemaking would just mean that the whole tank is whole cluster um, and whole berry. You're trying to ferment it completely in this method. So very cool. So we have a couple different types of crushers, destemmers. We have the one that we were just talking about where it separates the stems and crushes the berries. Um, this is really ideal when you don't want to get the stem flavor in your wine. Sometimes people do want the stem flavor. Um, and, there, and for that, there's a, a crusher that's called a crusher slash stem disintegrator. That will actually do exactly as it says. It will uh, break up the stems 
with the berries and so that way you can ferment them together. And so I don't have any pictures for this slide. Okay, moving on to pressing. Uh, pressing, of course, as we've seen in class, it's something we do to separate the juice from the skins. Um, whether it's a ferment, a, sorry, a finished fermenting wine or just the juice, um, pressing is extremely important. So we loaded the skins into the center of this basket here, and then we squeezed down, and all of the juice or newly fermented wine, depending on what you're making, came out, and all the skins were left behind. So the cool thing about this is you can actually control how much you press. So if you just wanted to take the free run and ferment that and call it a day, you could. But then uh, it's up to you how much you want to press after that. So you can really manipulate the composition of the, you know, the juice or the wine, depending on your choices there. Okay. With that being said, there is a process called direct to press. You will hear a lot of winemakers say this when they talk about making white wines. Uh, that's when we just put the whole clusters into the press and press it like that. And that's totally fine as long as you're not pressing too hard. You won't get any of the bitter uh, juices from the stems. You'll just get the juice from the grapes. It's very easy um, and it's, it's just more streamlined way to create white wine that way. Also for rosés too, just load up the red clusters, press them immediately and you will get some color out of that and you can make a rosé out of that. So. Um, yeah, you can do that. So there's different types of press fractions. This, uh, what you see here, is what looks a lot like our do 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 cylindrical press, which you see in a couple slides. So this is what that picture is trying to depict. Um, and it's just showing that if you loaded up that whole press, about 50% of the juice that comes out of that is going to be free run juice. So absolutely no pressure is applied to the to the cylinder, and that's what you would get. <clears throat> then what we have is called the first press fraction. That's when, <clears throat> pardon me, that's when we um, apply just a little bit of pressure, about two bars, and we squeeze just a little bit more juice out of that. So that's when you get another 30% of juice. Then we do a second press fraction, which has a maximum pressure of two bar, and then you get that extra 20% of juice. So the more that you press, the harder you press, the less recovery that you have, but overall, you get more and more and more. So it just depends on your style of winemaking. All right, so here's a great picture of free run. Juice is considered the highest quality of juice. Press fractions after this are put into tiers based off of increasing pressure that brings increasing bitterness for white wine, so be careful. Also, if you press extremely, extremely hard, um, you can extract some color, and that's a fantastic way to make some orange wine if you want to do that as well. So then after we're done pressing, you get a bunch of skins left over, and that is called pumice. Pumice is the remaining portion left over after pressing, and then, of course, we put that back into the vineyard as well um, to become compost. Okay, so moving on to different types of presses. We have basket press. This is really ideal for smaller volumes. Um, as you guys can see, the, the press that we had in class is a basket press, um, very low yields. It's not extremely efficient. Uh, once you press, like we saw in class two, you, it's very difficult to mix up the skins and press again, especially if you're working something this size. Um, so it can just be very difficult. However, um, for those low yields that you get, you got, also get low damage to the skins and seeds so you can get like a minimal, minimal extraction, but also minimal amount of like bitterness from the seeds and the skin. So it can just make some really nice, uh, beautiful soft wines potentially. So also for this, it's very difficult to get uniform pressing. So if you remember from class when you're pressing and then we reached in and mixed it up and how all of the berries basically in the center of the press couldn't get squeezed, like we couldn't press enough. Um, so it's not uniform pressing. The stuff on the outside feels the most pressure and on the top and bottom, but the stuff in the center kind of gets protected by all that mush. So it's not uniform. Also, this equipment can be very difficult to clean. Um, the wood component makes it uh, imp virtually impossible to be sterile because wood is very porous. And so you won't be able to um, 
completely sterilize that. So cleaning protocol has to be huge on that. Otherwise, it could be a huge source of contamination. Okay, moving on to cylindrical presses. This is very, very common in wineries all over the Sierra foothills. Uh, larger production wineries. Very big fan of this equipment. It's fantastic. It's um, great to make high quality wines. It can also be very dangerous to clean as well. So but we'll get into that. So um, cylindrical presses contain a piston, an air bladder, and a vacuum. So as you can see here, this is what the inside of the press looks like. It kind of looks like it's split down the middle, um, like a hot, hot dog way, where we have here little holes on the side of the press. That's where all the juice will kind of uh, squeeze out. Then on this other side, we have this kind of canvas looking bag. It's actually the uh, membrane and the air bladder. So this was what inflates and it uh, takes up any extra space in the press and it pushes the skins up against the grate where the juice comes out. So this is very, very helpful. It's easy to control the pressure uniformly across the entire space. Um, it has very elaborate pressing cycles where the airbag inflates and it rotates and holds it in certain positions and then it will deflate and it will roll several times and then reinflate to get anything that it missed and um, it's just very thorough. However, these pressing cycles can take a long time. They can take hours to process and at that point. You either multitask and do something else at the winery and process another type of fruit, hopefully a red, something you don't have to press immediately, and um, come back to it and clean it out later. So that can be that can be difficult. The yield on these is pretty moderate. Um, <clears throat> it's better than the basket press, but it's not as efficient as the screw press, as we'll see next. So these are difficult to clean because... Um, you actually do have to put a person inside of this piece of equipment to clean it. If you do not have a proper lockout tagout um, method, the machine could be turned on and it could start spinning again. And uh, people have died, unfortunately, from that. So don't want to sugarcoat it. And I don't want to be dramatic either, but it's very important that safety is practiced when you work in a very large scale a winery. So always look out for yourself. Cool. So then we have type, different types of cylindrical presses. We have this one with the piston here that kind of pushes it together. And then the one, the one we just saw, sorry, was the air bladder where it inflates and the bladder pushes up against the grapes and it squeezes up that way. Um, either way, you get juice and it's a happy day. Cool. So a screw press is pro most likely, I haven't seen it firsthand, but I'm assuming this is what really just ginormous companies like Franzia and Gallo use for a lot of their wines. The reason for that is it's very efficient. For a time, it's a continuous pre pressing action. So you don't need to do things in batches and loads. You just continuously load it and it continuously squeezes the crap out of these grapes. So this press was actually is actually used for a lot of other industries. It's called a dewatering press as well. And what you do is you actually dump grapes into this chute or fruit or even like really like muddy soiled water. Um, and then the screw forces it to become more and more and more compressed. The liquid will ooze out of this kind of like inner tube section. That at the very, very end, you'll see like just pure dry product come out of there. So for grapes, you would see grape juice come out of this section and then just really dry, kind of uh, really super crushed up, super torn up grape skins coming out this end. And so because it does so much damage to the skins, it has a very high yield as far as the juice that comes out of it, but it comes at a cost. You have huge amounts of tissue and seed damage, which will give you a lot more bitterness and astringency in your wines. Um, you also have a high solids content of juice, um, which is just like all of the uh, squishy pectin parts inside of the grape, like the pulp. You get a lot of grape pulp, which you'll end up racking out eventually anyways, but could be a waste of space in your tank. Um, but it is a continuous pressing action and it's very efficient. I also have a demo here from YouTube for those who want to see um, kind of just how this thing works because it can be a little hard to wrap your head around. 
but it's pretty intense. Okay, so when pressing, there are lots of additives that you can use to help you out to get the best, the most bang for your buck. So something that's very common is uh, just pressing needs in general, uh, rice holes. So rice holes look like this. You can get it at your local feed store. It's an inert material that's used as a hard surface to help press up against the grapes to squeeze out more juice. So it doesn't leave behind any flavor or cause any type of instability. It's completely inert and that's it's very, very common. If you want to use something a little more a little more zing to it, you can use a, a pectic enzyme. And this is just an enzyme that is called pectic because it breaks down pectin. Pectin is a really jelly-like substance that holds plant cells together. And there are some varieties that just are very, very difficult to press because of this. So like muscats, Riesling, and Sylvaner are all just like really glue like it's very difficult to extract that juice from the grape so it's very common to see these enzymes um, used for those types of varieties otherwise you're barely going to get any juice from those grapes you're going to waste a lot of money and a lot of time okay so now we're going to move into just kind of more ways to extract from grapes for pre-treatments so you can actually freeze your grapes or freeze your must. And with this process, as we know that um, grapes are mostly water, but they're also sugar, um, they, water actually um, enlarges as it freezes. So because of this, it, it, it causes the cells to literally burst open um, in the grape. So um, this will help to help to expand the level of extraction in the grapes to get higher tannins and also higher anthocyan anthocyanins, it's the color compound from that. Um, this, what's really important about this too is that they have to be kept very, very cold. And it's very important to use dry ice to blanket the must and prevent oxidation. So the dry ice, which is just frozen carbon dioxide, as it um, starts to evaporate, that CO2 blankets it and like, like it says, prevents any oxidation or prevents any um, potential yeast from starting up. So keeping it cold is, is very important. So a side note on anthocyanins, it can be a very intimidating word. It's a big word, uh, scientific chemistry word. Anthocyanins are really just a, a plant pigment. It's what's naturally used to color a lot of flowers and fruits. It's one of the most beautiful parts of nature are anthocyanins. Um, in wine, it's what gives wine its red color, and it's associated with antioxidants and color stability. And if you don't know what antioxidants are, they're fantastic things that fight free radicals. They're anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and anti-cancer. So these are also the class of compounds. We talk about why a glass of what red wine is healthy to drink. It's good for you. Um, this is the class of compounds that we're talking about. Okay, so another way to uh, treat your must uh, and kind of manipulate it the way you need is cryo extraction or cryo concentration. So cryo, um, it means to freeze. So this is something that we do. It's very energy intensive, um, just like grape freezing. Um, but what you're doing is you're helping to increase the sugar content of your juice or your must. So what they're doing here is this is a tank full of juice and you can see this little white jacket on the outside. That's not the color of the tank. That's actually literally a sheet of ice because the thermostat is set so cold on here. It's formed ice around the tank. So that's just the glycol it's moving through. So what will happen is water will freeze first so just like we talked about for ice wines and the berry, so now we're talking about on a large scale as a juice. So if you freeze the tank, the water will freeze first and the juice is left, the sugary juice is left behind. So you can actually utilize this to up the sugar content in your tanks. Um, so this is something that's used if your grapes get diluted by rain during harvest or something. Um, this will also inhibit any type of spoilage bacteria that may be present on the grapes if there's like a bunch of mold and stuff because they won't be able to operate in such cold comp uh, 
cold situations. So it's very fun. Withering of grape berries um, is one of my favorite winemaking techniques because it's just so expensive <laughs> and so hard and just takes so much time. So not only did we harvest our grapes at the right time, but now we are individually hanging them out to dry in a, a fancy room with the right humidity and right temperature on, you know, either hanging them or putting them on bamboo racks for months. And what's going to happen is these berries are going to dehydrate and we're going to concentrate all those flavors in those grapes. So they basically hang them out until whatever sugar content they want is reached. So again, it's a very expensive procedure. You have to have the building and the space to do this, the patience and the resources. And it's very, very common in some parts of Italy. You can actually buy some wines that are made in this style at Total Wine. I was able to buy um, an Apassimento wine from Total Wine. But here's a little article from Wine Enthusiast if you're interested in learning more. But that is something you can do pre-fermentation. Okay, so we, <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about pre-fermentation cold soak and extended maceration. This is where it comes into play in our lecture. Um, this is a lot. The process of this is a lot like cold brew coffee. So cold brew coffee is what it's, it's called cold brew because you don't brew it hot. You actually just soak the coffee grounds in cold water for like 24 to 48 hours. And what it does is it gives you coffee with an extreme amount of caffeine because it's very concentrated. But it also, the whole point of cold brew is to min minimize bitterness and keep a lower acidity in the coffee. So <clears throat> this is a way for grapes to do a similar thing. You enhance extraction of color and flavor, just like the cold brew coffee. You're extracting those flavors from the coffee grounds. And it really helps bring out some beneficial aromas and flavors that are, that are also extracted during fermentation. So it just gives you a little bit more time to extract before you start fermentation. Um, and that way you can get, hopefully, a better wine. Cool. So here was a study done on Chenin Blanc. And for this, we have a couple of different sections here. So in red, we have the wines that were control. So this was not cold soaked. This is just regular fermented wine. And what we have here is a, um, a PCA chart, so principal component analysis. So this is a biplot of different aromas that people got from the wines, and then they rated them on a, like a scale. And then the wines were placed um, on that chart to show kind of the correlation of the wines and the aromas that came with that as well. So for control, uh, without doing cold soak, we are in this quadrant here. We had flavors of banana, pineapple, passion fruit, and mint, interestingly enough. Then we did an experiment with fermentation on the skins, which is FOS here. So we have FOS 1, 2, and 3. And for that, we got a lot of sour, astringent, raisin, honey, and marmalade characteristics. Cool. Then we have a CBF, which is skin contact before fermentation of the cold soak. And for that, we get stone fruit, cooked vegetable, and yellow apple components. So pre-fermentation cold soak definitely made a difference for the white. Here we have another one for trial that was done for Goodwood Streaminer. And this one's really interesting too. So um, this is like a spider web. And these are the different components um, these were selected for the judges to compare all wines against. And it goes on a scale of 0 to, um, let's say, 5 here. So this, the judges rated each one. So for the control, that's our green circle. And we're kind of just kind of very intermediate, equal components of like clove, passion fruit, and all these things. Then we have a Gewurztraminer that was whole cluster press. And for that, we got a little more sour less hay and kind of floral components but more passion fruit apple and then moderate fruit by mouth then we have the 24-hour skin contact plus an enzyme to help press of course 
And just look how off the chart these components are. Super floral in the mouth. Has more body. Tons of apple and passion fruit. More clove, caramel, and rose blossom. But also it's less sour and uh, definitely less of the hay component. So definitely a huge sensory impact on the Gortz Trimeter. Um, so just because those studies were done on whites doesn't mean it can't be done on reds. Um, cold soaking for reds, very similar situation. Um, technically we hold it, we try to hold it below 50 degrees Fahrenheit before fermentation. This is just the safe temperature to keep any native yeast from starting to ferment and any spoilage from happening. So like I said, it provides a head start on color and flavor extraction. Um, <clears throat> people can do it anywhere between 3 to 10 days. I think 10 days can be really difficult to manage. Uh, dry ice is really expensive and it's a really crucial part to the cold soak and it's just very energy intensive in general to keep your must that cold for that long. Um, okay, so it's also, it's very common to see this process done with reds that just naturally lack colors so like Pinot Noir, Grenache, this can help kind of concentrate them in that process. Cool. So if it does get warm, you're going to enable the bloom of non-saccharomyces yeast. That's the native yeast I was talking about. And it's very prominent in Oregon, of course. I always enjoy doing cold soaking because it ends up being near, like, in October. And it's very, very spooky because you see, like, all the fog forming. So that's kind of fun. So here's just a picture from Wine Folly just talking about cold soaking. Um, the important thing to note is that cold soaking does not extract tannin. So remember that cold soaking is not for extracting tannin, it's just for color and flavors. Okay, now we have another process we can do called thermovinification. So instead of cooling your must, um, this is a process where you expose your must to a high temperature for a short amount of time. Um, with this, it's a lot like brewing coffee or tea. Um, the flash, you know, heating helps uh, to promote rapid extraction of phenolic compounds from the skins, particularly color, uh, for making red wines. So what we have here is kind of like a heat exchanger. There's just a bunch of tubes going back and forth. And these are, um, these are quite hot. So it's, they're actually started by a um, glycol system or heating system. And the wine will pass through here. And it'll just be very, very hot for a very short amount of time that'll cool down again. So there are some consequences of thermovinification. Um, again, sorry, I don't have any pictures on this slide. So exposing the wine to that amount of heat will denature enzymes, um, which can be good. They'll denature enzymes that ca can cause browning in wine. It will increase the color extraction. It'll also increase the phenolics, which, which contribute to taste, color, and mouthfeel in a wine. It will alter your the flora of your microbiome in that must, which can be for better or worse. I definitely wouldn't be able to do native fermentation after this because you would have killed everything. It's a lot easier to press because um, the skins have basically been cooked. So they're a lot softer. And then you also get uh, characteristic flavor changes too. And then if you want to know more about phenolics, we have a uh, system or a link there for you. Okay, here's just a chart to show you what's going on. Um, you have some cold must, and you, you can heat it very quickly, and then you cool it back down to 40 degrees. Then you let it sit uh, with the skins in 0 to 12 hours, press it, and then you can ferment just the juice and create a red wine from there. So it actually helps to... Um, can kind of control your situation because you are basically sterilizing the product from any type of microbes by ultra heating your must. You're super extracting all those colors and flavors immediately. Then you're just letting it sit on the skins for a little bit of time to get some more extraction, press it, and then you can ferment the juice in the tank. So you won't have to worry about I don't know. If it just works better for your style of setup for your winery, then, then that's good. But oftentimes we'll utilize thermovinification if 
the grapes are really moldy or there's like a really big concern of spoilage. That's a good way to kill it right away. Okay, so here are the sensory changes with thermovinification. In red, we have our thermovinification wine. In green is kind of our control. It's our fermentation on the skins for eight days, which is very typical for red wine. So comparing the green to red, green is normal. Red is thermovinification treatment. With the thermo flash, we get a lot more of cassis, cherry, and strawberry. A little bit more rosemary and spicy components. It's, interestingly enough, less bitter and astringent, but about the same amount of color and about the same amount of body, and less bell pepper. So thermovinification definitely had a huge difference uh, compared to just a regular fermentation. So, and I would argue that I actually really like these differences compared to the regular, so it would be fun to do that. Okay, we're almost there, I promise. So, because I said these are must pre-treatments, we um, included Sonye in these slides, which you guys already know about this. Um, so again, it's just bleeding off some juice to help concentrate the red wine in a tank. Then we ferment that juice on the side and create a rosé. So get two fantastic wines, two birds with one stone. Here's a little picture for you guys. And then we have some review questions. So these are again, just to help you with the quiz. Um, so and help to guide you and studying for the quiz. All right, I know that was kind of a long-winded lecture. Um, thank you guys for sticking with it. The beauty of these videos is you can pause and come back at any time. Um, so hopefully you, you can know that you can utilize that. Um, yeah, hope you guys learned something new. Hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, of course, you can always answer or always send me an email. I'd be happy to answer those. And yeah, I will see you guys next time.